On my left hand side is pylons, the white area. On my right hand side is a langa, which is a black area. And this is how the government separated the two by building a road here with a rail uh, road on the, on the other side. So the black people cannot cross into the white uh, area. The apartheid system was designed uh, in a way which was calculated fundamentally to marginalize the majority of the people from participation in the country's political life. The country was balkanized into what was called then homelands, which meant that the majority of the citizens who happened to be black had no say in the political affairs of the country. We were able to include the masses of this country in the kind of negotiations we did. So it wasn't a, a, an elitist discussion that took place in some smoke-filled room that decided the future of this country. The people of this country decided its future. Once you sit and talk to your enemy, you learn to understand that their fears are very real. They have fears like yours. At the end, it's security about themselves, their families, and it's about the simple things in life. How can I have a future for my child? The, the main negotiating partners uh, had very different views on the future of the South African state. The ANC and the other liberation movements wanted a strong centralized state in line with countries around us on the continent. And the National Party wanted a break on, on central authority and favored uh, decentralized government. When we went into negotiations, the ANC wanted a strong central government. Our opposition wanted the power to be as diluted as possible. And the only way they could see it was in the form of strong provincial governments. The new system needed to place at its center the drive to ensure that there are greater possibilities for people to actually participate in the affairs of state. That is why besides the national and the provincial spheres of government, we have a system of local government which is based on what the notion of wall-to-wall -wall representation at local level. Whereas in the past, there were parts of the country where there was no form of local go elected local government at all. When the, when the rains come down, these shacks, they flood. And then the people get sick, there's nowhere else for them to go. And then some of them die of, 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 of TB because of the way the conditions that they are living in. What we are seeing here is uh, the flats that the uh, city of Cape Town has been building. As you can see, they advertise city of Cape Town. Construction number 463. Uh, they are taking away the shacks, building these flats. 
it is a brick a bowl by, by with bricks and it's got running water and hot water and it's got um, uh, flushing toilets so it is just a way of upgrading people's lives that used to stay uh, years in sex and was born in sex. I think you only need to look at the statistics to be entirely convinced that we've made huge strides. I mean, the, the, uh, the success of, of South Africa in, in extending basic services, because remember we came from a situation where the apartheid government essentially deliberately neglected the majority of the population in terms of basic services, electricity, water, sanitation, sewerage. Uh, South Africa has done a tremendous job over the last 15 to 20 years in extending basic services uh, into marginalized areas, into rural areas, into the townships. Um, um, Soweto in the 80s was a, a dusty township, an unsafe uh, part of Johannesburg. I grew up in Soweto from 1959 to 1981 for 22 years without electricity. The majority of the streets of Soweto were not tarred. There is not a single street in Soweto today which is not tarred. Behind us, in this empty field, there's going to be offices. On to the right of me, currently, is the newly finished, newly finished uh, Soweto Theatre. It must be three or four years old. Behind it, there's a hospital, newly finished hospital called Begim Langin. Local government is largely responsible for the built environment. So water and sanitation, electricity, refuse removal, in the larger municipalities, especially in the metropolitan municipalities, you find that local government is also takes on some social responsibilities. But outside of the metros, you find that it's less the case. A new system needed to place at its center the drive for the reunification of the country. In other words, to say we are building one nation out of these diverse ethnic groups that we have. And in order to achieve that, you needed to have a national sphere of government with the necessary powers to facilitate this process of nation building. We needed to get beyond the ethnic impulses which the apartheid government was always trying to resuscitate. And in retrospect, I think that is perhaps the greatest achievement of both the ANC as well as the, I won't say the ANC alone, but the anti-apartheid forces as, uh, and the fact that we were able to unite a nation and have, have a patriotism to a single state. And we translated that in trying to have a strong uh, central government. The national government holds almost all of the security and justice related powers. I mean, that's a very significant feature of our, of our, of our federal construct. Uh, police, justice, the courts is all centralized. Uh, the major portfolios, such as um, 
health, education, uh, but also the environment, uh, are all uh, fu functions that are shared by the national government and the provincial government. But the interesting feature there of the South African system is that almost across all the big ticket uh, uh, functions, uh, it's the national government that makes the laws and the provincial government that implements those laws. The main functions of provincial government are social services. That's the easiest way to sum it up. So you've got health, you've got education, you've got social services, and then you have some other functions thrown in there also, such as roads and agriculture and so forth. This is also one of the reasons why provincial government doesn't have its own revenue sources, is because there isn't really a, a basis for uh, economic activity that can generate revenue sources. The ANC government is still very reluctant to even use the word federalism. Um, for example, I remember a, uh, a meeting of the board of the organization that I worked for where one very prominent ANC activist was a board member and when he heard that we were doing work on federalism, he sort of exclaimed in a meeting, why are we doing work on federalism? I went to jail to make sure we were not going to become a federal state. Uh, so there's still a lot of uh, anxiety around federalism and autonomy of regions. Uh, because it's seen as harking back to the days of, of ethnic segregation. We must become a unitary state with one central government that can control the country and a government which we can hold accountable for the feelings. Well, we are one South Africa, aren't we? Uh, it's just that uh, we have not configured the things correctly, in my opinion. Um, I think that it is just unworkable because we are paying 10 governments. Do you understand? I'm trying to keep it very simple. Um, it, it, it just doesn't work. What we've learned, and I think I need to, to, to explain to you that 20 years hence, after we've passed the Constitution, I've learned that despite our initial opposition to decentralization, and particularly the, the establishment of provinces, in fairness, the provinces have allowed local expression. The fact that we have provincial government that has been drawn up, the boundaries have been drawn up by and large around the ethnic identities, there is expression. So you have a very good balance between what you have the notion of a strong state, but at the same time you have regional and local expression. You, we could not afford, we could ill afford any area in this country that was politically marginalized. I think we've come a long way. We've come through a peaceful route rather than, rather than a violent route. And I think that is something to 
to celebrate. What we got was a better resolution to problems than the barrel of the gun. The great positive lesson that, that, that I think we can learn from the South African transition is to be very uh, conscious and deliberate about your transition. Uh, I've seen a lot of countries literally diving into decentralization or federalism with very little regard for the practical consequences of converting a previously centralized system into a decentralized system. It doesn't happen with the stroke of a pen. It takes years and years of building new institutions, breaking down old institutions, changing cultures, changing mindsets. One of the key lessons that we've learned in South Africa is that setting up and maintaining an effective system of intergovernmental relations is absolutely critical to making sure that you have clear communication flowing throughout the entire system. We don't have a hierarchical tiered system where we say national is up there and local is down here. We have a sphere system where we are colleagues to each other. People grow up with suspicion. People grow up hating each other. And the only way you can address that is by ensuring that whatever solution, constitutional solution there is, is one that is owned by the people, not the politicians. Uh, we don't want to hold out our own experience as a blueprint for everybody else. Uh, we learned a lot from others. But in the end, we did what our own analysis of our own situation told us needed to be done. That is the operative principle. Learn from others, but the, um, uh, the solutions to your problems must be as novel as your own analysis tells you you must do. I'm very proud. I'm very, uh, as f looking at where we come from as a nation. I mean, obviously we have problems and, and, and you know, and struggles and all that. But and looking at the privileges that we have today, life is, is it's better. Life is better, way better. Life is way, and it gets better each and every, each and every year. Yeah.